Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome to another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. I am sitting down today in Boston in the Autodesk Technology Center with Amr Rafat, the Chief Innovation Officer at Windover Construction. Windover recently won a second Autodesk Excellence Award in 2022 for accelerating transformation for their groundbreaking use of technology on a housing project here in Massachusetts located outside of Boston. This project leveraged some of the cool technology that was developed right here in the space that we're sitting in. I'm really excited to be here. And before we get too deep into it, of course, if you're out there listening and you're one of our tried and true audio listeners, we are in the technology center. And so you should head over to YouTube for just a minute and take a look at the cool space we're here. I am sitting right next to Robot. There is a geodesic dome that is being built out for outer space right behind me. There's a bunch of cool stuff. If you're unfamiliar with the Autodesk Technology Centers, it's located in the Seaport Innovation District, and it provides access to a large format fabrication equipment, a wide range of robotics, training, and a bunch of expertise from the Autodesk personnel. And it's a really cool place place where global leaders come together and really find ways to bring innovative tools together. Amr has been working in this space for the last five years. I had him on the show about a year and a half ago. I'm really excited to catch up with you. How are you doing today, Amr? Hi, Eric. How are you? Uh, So excited to be with you today. Um, I've been watching your video interviews. It's great educational content, really about sharing ideas and uh, helping us move the industry forward through this uh, exchange of ideas. So, so excited to be with you today. And we appreciate you because, you know, the show wouldn't be anything without guests like yourself having the opportunity to, to share their experience. And I know you've, you've been involved in the technology centers for a number of years now, I think starting since 2019. Can you tell me a bit about that experience and the impact that it's had on your business and, uh, you know, just the impact on the construction industry? I consider the Autodesk Tech Center as a hub for innovation where we can share ideas um, and the collaborations. We built uh, global collaborations in here with uh, uh, manufacturers such as Howick in New Zealand, uh, mixed reality experts and the builder of uh, software like Twin Build and Photogram in Australia, uh, other folks in Canada. So we're building these collaborations that can really transform the industry forward. You know, co- innovative construction company like us who are experts in construction technology, along with uh, developers of software, along with robotics and automation experts and manufacturer of machines. That's how we can really push this industry forward. And I'd like to give a shout out to the Tech Center team and to the community here because the Tech Center team is very supportive. They actually embrace uh, uh, the teams that's here at the Tech Center and they help us uh, make these connections, connect the dots basically. And it's such a cool community. And I think community is the real word there. We've got some other guests coming on later on this week that also work here. And just the the enthusiasm for the opportunities that generate here and, you know, just trying stuff out. It's it's a really cool opportunity to step in and just find a place to consider new ways to either use existing technology or create brand new technology that simply hasn't been out to market before. And so as your company's been in this space for a while now, how has working in the tech center impacted the financial side of your business or the growth of your business and, you know, protected your team's bottom line a little bit in the last few years. It's been crazy to put it lightly since, uh, since we last spoke. Absolutely. I agree with you. So uh, many of the technology leading edge technologies that we developed here at the tech center that's not been used on construction sites before uh, actually went over vision is to apply these technologies, stop uh, testing and start the building. Mm-hmm. That's our, uh, vision there is that we apply it on jobs with really schedule to provide value, uh, whether it's cost efficiency for our clients or efficiency to save time. So many of the projects that work at home here with digital prefab in, the, in those machines, the machine behind me here it was a Howick with a, a s- bigger 3D printers. We took additive manufacturing, for example, on a historic preservation project north of Boston 
to create exact replicas for that historic preservation. So using additive manufacturing, I consider the space here uh, is our, uh, uh, our gateway to cross industry innovation. There are uh, technologies that's been used in automotive, in industrial construction, aerospace, that we can really apply into our construction workflows to make it provide huge cost savings for our clients as well as increase quality as well. So that's, uh, that's what we've actually been doing. And actually, uh, through the last three years, it's been a safeguard for our, what, some of our projects. We created almost a thousand trusts. I, th I don't think we, we were able to deliver it some other way, uh, the waiting the waiting for, for these parts to come and arrive on site was almost a year. Yeah. We're able to create it in 15 hours here at the tech center, very efficiently cutting 70% of the cost and the time using some of the most uh, innovative technologies here combined with the BIM data in fusion, as well as the uh, machinery itself uh, to produce and enhance and streamline production. And, and if you're out there listening and you're curious about those machines, make sure you go back and listen to the last episode that I had on Moran because we, we went in depth with, uh, with him and Howick to, to really learn what they are. And I think at the end of this episode, we might take a moment to go actually take a peek at them. And I'm excited to be sitting in front of it instead of at my desk out on the West Coast having this conversation. So it's, it's pretty cool. And one of the earlier conversations that you and I had, you mentioned that AI is playing a big part in some of the historical renovation that you're doing and that preservation work that you're doing that you're just alluding to. Can you tell me more about your use of AI, both in the realm of that preservation and the other impacts that it's having on, you know, just your business and construction at large? Actually, there are a couple of projects that we're working on right now uh, for historic preservation that use digital prefab, AI-enabled BIM, uh, platforms such as Fusion, it, it can make simulations so we can really test how these parts will become, uh, identify the critical elements of our design, design for manufacturing and assembly, DFMA, which is a big part now of BAM. We're taking BAM data for, uh, that only originally came from laser scan of existing conditions, taking that BAM data to manufacturing. And that's how our actually VDC team at Wendover is focusing on taking BAM to action, to making the, of the things. And that's how we can really enhance and actually help advance the way we build every day in our job sites. Uh, there are a shortage. This is one of the ways we can tackle using AI-enabled uh, platforms. That's how we can tackle shortage of uh, skilled labor, things that's been done by hand 120 years ago. We don't necessarily have the folks who have the skill set or even the time to build these parts, so we can really create these parts very efficiently with any material using this AI technology. So that's, that's why we, we're trying to push all the time. And clients are excited about it. I noticed in the last three years, it doesn't take much to convince the client that this is the way to go because it's providing cost savings, high quality. When they see the samples that we're going to do it yeah. later, they see the high quality uh, into it. So I actually were there in pushing AI into our manufacturing process and industrialized construction. And it's, it's so refreshing to see because we've... We've been talking about prefabrication and modular construction and more of these innovative methods for a long time. And there's been a lot of skeptics and the resourcing and the technology and the tools hadn't necessarily converged in a way that they we were kind of forced to in the last few years in some situations. And it's just very encouraging because I remember when I was still touching proposals and responding to RFPs when I was working at General Contractors, which feels like two decades or three decades ago at this point, we would talk about prefab and it was all very low hanging fruit. It was like casework and, you know, electrical stuff that was very minor, you know, cabinetry and such. And to be able to step back and go, we can prefabricate these elements at such a, a scale. And it's not just a nice to have, it's a core element of the building and how we build now. It's, it's just changed everything. And again, if you, if you're excited about what we're talking about right now, you really should go and listen to our previous conversation because we get really deep into prefab and some of those other um, really cool technologies. But as, as we're looking at the future right now, thinking about AI and some of those other adjacent technologies like machine learning, how do you think they're really going to impact construction in the built world? Like if you look in maybe 5, 10, 15 years, where do you think we're going to be sitting in contrast to today? We actually have an opportunity in our field, in the EECU space, to make a big difference in the carbon footprint for, the, for our planet. Uh, we, we have a great opportunity with the technology we have right now. For example, uh, Wendova right now is building a, a building in Connecticut for Blueprint Robotics. It will be the uh, largest uh, mass timber uh, industrialized uh, factory 
uh, for mass timber in, in the United States, in North America. Wow. Uh, we, we are building that. It's going to be net zero, uh, and it's going to be a uh, fully mass timber structure. See, uh, so that's actually pushing prefab to solve the problems like uh, global warming and they tackle these issues. Uh, another uh, important aspect of it is tackling the long lead items with manufacturing pieces uh, very efficiently, identifying parts in the buildings that we can build. It's like, and we learned that a long way from automotive industry and how to make parts of the building more efficient, yeah. uh, ready to be assembled on site with high quality as well as in areas like in New England, we had Wendover built, a, Wendover is a go-to for, almost a go-to for modular construction in New England. There was a building at Endicott College that we built is that I don't think is other way to build it other than modular. We built it modular because there were snowstorm after snowstorm. So we were able to take away that built-in uh, on-site components and replace that with ready modular, uh, ready modular components that's a very high quality built in a factory, assembled on site in a very short time to tackle these issues, to meet schedule issues and they also deliver the high quality for the client. So uh, the future is a really combination of how we use industrialized construction with BIM data and it's all coming along instead of silos of technologies to work in harmony together to deliver a solution based um, uh, to, to tackle these challenges. And we're kind of turning that old, that building model on its head where we go, the owner decides, okay, I want a building. I'm going to design it from start to finish. Okay, now I'm going to put it out to bid. Now I'm going to hand it to the contractor and they're going to build it with no interaction with the designer who put all these plans together. Then we hand it over. The, the nature of our scheduling, the nature of our resourcing and everything means we have to be a bit more fluid than we've ever been comfortable being before, especially when we don't have as many talent coming into the construction industry and all of those ongoing challenges. And so as, as we find ways to merge innovative approaches like yours, as long as we can convince the owners that these are viable solutions and can have real conversations about it, I feel like we're in a very good position to mitigate some of those risks that we're all you know, looking down at in the next five to 10 years as well. And I, I appreciate the focus on the environmental impact too. And I think some people get tired of thinking about the quantity of waste that we contribute to in construction construction, but it's something we can we can have an impact on. It just really means that we have to step back and think about those ideas at a big picture and then implement them in an effective way. Because if you don't train everybody, if you don't connect all the dots and use the right technology so your your factory is connected to people who are out there building, you're still going to have risk. And that's where I hear the most pushback from field teams. They go, oh, they built that off site and they never talked to us. It's never going to connect or whatever. But I don't think that's true if your systems are set up correctly. Absolutely. And to tackle actually is a Construction industry has been known as if it's only for the hammer, but now we're trying, actually, when Dover is working with technical schools in our area, to let the new generations, the new graduates know that it's more about innovation. You can still use robotics and automation and actually things that look like video games with VR. Yeah. Get them excited about the industry to get into it, and they can have a bright career in our industry. So that's what we're trying to push in there, and that's how we can actually... Uh, uh, overcome and uh, tackle all these challenges with skilled labor. And all you have to do is step back and show them a place like this. Like you can come and work in a space like this and use robotics and all these other tools. And it's not just pouring concrete and pounding nails. And obviously that's still always going to be a part of what we do in construction. We are building things, but the, the approaches are so different than they were even 10 years ago. And so I, I agree with you. I think it's there's a perception issue and there's a communication issue that we need to tackle where we're communicating in a more accurate way what people are signing up for when they get into our industry and you know all these different tools and ways of optimizing are also doing away with like when i was doing proposal management and you know contract modifications 8 10 12 hour days all the time and i know as we can dial that back to a more equitable and reasonable work life balance that also has some more appeal to it because it's hard to sell somebody on 6 days a week 10 hours a day that's, that's rough so I know uh, we were also speaking about some digital tw digital twin technology the last time we were connecting, and I would like to hear a little bit more about how you're leveraging and implementing that on your projects, and also if those decisions were driven by the owner of those projects or if, if that was something that Windover brought to the table. So we constantly at Windover are looking for ways to deliver high quality and improve the workflows for our clients and bring them the latest and greatest solutions that can save them time and have them have a, f a user-friendly platform. So for years, 
for years we've been delivering uh, Eric uh, uh, books like um, O and M manuals. Yeah, uh, here's your mountain of bid documents and handover package. And yeah, that goes in a filing cabinet for the next thirty exactly. years. Exactly, it doesn't make sense anymore. The time for this has been gone. In most of our projects, almost ninety percent of when Dover projects, for example, and other other build, great builders, we have we end up with a fully coordinated. Uh, 3D uh, coordinated model mm -hmm. uh, with all the trades in it. You have MEB, mechanical, you name it. And then when we ended, it doesn't make sense that at the end we, we deliver to the client to those books. Yeah. We wanted to invest a little bit more into those models and make them user-friendly, comprehensive data, and add all the O and M manual data through AI. We use, for example, Autodesk Tandem. Which is very easy to use. We 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 then we transform the way we hand over the handout process to our clients. And client loved it. We just finished a project at Philips uh, Exeter Academy, mm -hmm. our new dorm there. When we deliver this, they have access to it from their iPad. The facility management team. It's really transforming how facility managers can view their buildings because at their fingertips, you don't even need a QR code. In their fingertips, they can go to any room, click on all of the um, MEB air handling units, even lighting fixtures, and all this information which data come up when it was installed, model numbers, warranty information, everything. And then we are taking that even a next step by adding sensors into these these elements in the building so you can keep track of building performance which would and that's the next that's the future step i'm seeing a lot of that too I'm, I'm a nerd in the internet of things world as far as my home being connected but in a facility like we're in right now it's an entirely different level and it's it's more engaging and it's more modern and i think it also very positively impacts the cost of owning and maintaining that facility and so I'm impressed that you're able to convince your owners and say, hey, this is a worthwhile thing to add on because it's hard to pivot into the world of digital twins if you do it when construction's done. Like that's that's a difficult moment to do that. But if you're thinking about it through the whole process, you're going to have something that lives and breathes and functions right alongside the building for the entire history of the, you know, until that facility ends up being renovated or replaced in the future. You're bringing up a great point, Eric. This will become a living document that can get updated in 10 years when they replace that air handling unit. They can plug in all this new data. So it's a living document. And we, we our goal is to make this a standard for our projects. This uh, We are working on our third project. We did one for our Harvard University faculty housing as well as at Endicott College. So it's becoming more and more a standard for our handover process to provide a good value for clients that they can build up on. For many times, we think that this handover process is the end of the project life cycle, but it's actually the start for the client and building user. And that's how we should think about it, look at it. Yeah. Is your relationship as a, as a builder extending beyond handover then to help them with those um, models to continue that maintenance or the owners that you're working with, are they handling that themselves? Not necessarily. Uh, actually, w uh, the, the methodology we're using is that we build these detailed models and with very minimal trainings, you can take on this process as facility managers in those, at those campuses to take it on in, in the future. So we developed a really comprehensive data, easy to use, for, user friendly for them so they can, they, they can enjoy using it and they can even grow it within their canvases. So that's the goal, is to make it self-sufficient um, when we hand, it to the, uh, hand them the project. It's encouraging to hear because that's one topic that I've heard as far as pushback goes, where if you're not a serial builder or necessarily have those tech chops in-house, there's some concern of, okay, you hand over this digital twin package in your handover process, and they're not sure if they can maintain it or keep it up to date. And as you alluded to a moment ago, if it isn't up to date in 10 years when you change all those things, the value starts to diminish over time because you don't really have that accurate insight into what's you know under the skin as far as what's in your building goes. So I, I appreciate that context. And it's good to know that they don't, they don't require extensive training and you know, BIM tools and everything else to continue you know, leveraging these, these tools that you hand them. Absolutely. So what else do you think contributes to the success of a, a digital twin after that handover process? Is there any advice that you would give for the owners to, to keep that process you know, alive in, in creating that document that we're talking about? Actually, to, to start the process from the very beginning, to keep in mind that at the very beginning of the project, all the, if it's good for the MEB coordination, it will be good for digital twin. 
build the models, make sure that all the models will include all the trades, all the geometrical data. Then we can add at the end, when we, before we just deliver the handover, all the O&M manual and the non-geometrical information, yeah. which is catalogs and links to, to different things. Uh, actually, they don't have to be a BIM experts, a client, and that's, that's what actually changed the way we view a digital twin in the last two years is that clients don't have to be BIM experts to use these models. So BIM experts built those models. So for many years to come, clients can use it easily. So starting with adding all these data from the beginning will make it really easy towards the end to really invest a little bit more with a week or two work in these platforms, digital twin like Tandem, to, to, to deliver uh, information rich data for our clients. And if you're an owner out there that's listening right now, this is a subtle push to make sure you're including guidance on this in the RFP from the from this onset because I think the owners who are thinking about this from that point ensures that the bids that come through are considering that as far as how they build everything and how they work together and if you've set that baseline you know for every bid that you receive or they're thinking about the digital twin as that end state it's going to be a lot easier in your selection process to make sure that you have everything covered I'm obviously showing my uh, my former history as being a proposal <laughs> manager right now um, I've received too many RFPs that were copy and pasted from a prior building, and I'm like, these requirements make no sense. Uh, but I think if is as we get more progressive in the technology that our owners are adopting, it's it's now a requirement to include what your expectations are in that RFP stage as far as the technology and the level of depth that it has. Because if you don't set your GCs up for success when they're going through that bidding process, you might surprise them. And I think also the GCs out there listening, if your owner isn't thinking about these tools and you recognize the value of them, especially if you have a strong relationship with them, that's when you start talking about this and you receive the RFP and you say, hey, this is all great, especially in the commercial world. This is harder on the federal side of things. Hey, this is great. Did you think about this? Because this is a betterment that we can offer your organization that is going to you know, leave you as the owner in a much better position in 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 years versus, you know, the standard RFP that didn't consider the technology at the scale that we're talking about right now. And it doesn't even have to be a new construction. We are working with a client right now that we are laser scanning their facility, MEB facility, and uh, creating detailed models of it to add, to add it to a, a platform, a digital twin platform, so they can keep track of building pro progress and uh, support their future facility uh, management. So it can be an existing building that built 30 years ago and we built a digital twin for it. So it doesn't have to be actually a new construction. And You make a fantastic point there too. And I, and I had somebody telling me about this the other day and I can't remember who it was, but there there is room to make that happen if it's already been built, obviously. The process is a little bit more involved, but like you said, the tools and the technology are available to us now in a way that they simply weren't before. And so if you are looking to take your facilities and maybe half your campus has been built and half of it is not, you can still get that whole facility. It just takes some really focused you know, intention as far as the data that you're capturing. And the amount of data that we have in our BIM documents and all of these tools and technologies now, it's, it's so much more actionable than it ever be, has been historically for those working out in the field and who are building, those who are in the office, for the owners as well, because they have more visibility on the process and the progress of your construction when you give them dashboards and access to that data in a way that they might not have had unless you're you know, having a, your, your weekly owners meeting where you tell them the good and the bad news. And, and we've been doing this in, in so many cases, like in, at Endicott College, we documented the whole entire campus with reality capture with drone LIDAR, and then we embed that into facility management. We handed that to the client to support their future facility management and growth for the campus. Same thing with a town, a city here in New England, we documented the whole area, the whole buildings, took it from a, only a small one building to document uh, with a drone LIDAR the whole city and we embed this to their facility management uh, city uh, database so it can support with this digital twin information rich data their future projects. Yeah, I think we're finally at the point now where the old entrenched facilities management tools, they still have their place. That's not a full replacement, but there's there's a layer that we can add on to this that adds a whole lot more actionable, valuable data. I mean, do you really want your facilities team on your 10 mile long campus, if there's a light bulb out, to drive to that building, climb up a ladder, get the light bulb out, look at the model and drive back to figure out how to replace it? Or do they pull up the digital twin and go, this is the light bulb that was installed two and a half years ago. This is the model 
model, this is the one we need, and they just order it and send it off and put it in. The amount of savings you have there is huge. And you don't have a guy on the ladder twice as much as he would have needed otherwise, so there's a safety aspect to it too. Absolutely. So I think it's safe to say that Windover has developed a, a much larger global presence since the last time we spoke. I know you're working with Howick and some organizations over in APAC, but what has really enabled this rapid growth outside the borders of the United States since the last time we spoke? It's actually the trust. Uh, the trust we developed with our uh, nationwide clients. We do work in California right now, in Los Angeles, uh, with BEM work and the reality capture. We do work in uh, Pennsylvania with historic preservation. We're doing work in Texas with multifamily. And globally, uh, we've been working with one of the great uh, Dubai uh, developers who are doing work in Australia. What actually we built is that we built trust between us and them utilizing the technology in a very practical, efficient, and effective ways to deliver a value, whether it's cost savings. We are, we be, we are working with towns and cities uh, nationally and internationally to support them to expedite the permitting process, for example. So it's about trust, building great things with great people. The people aspect in that innovation is what, is what really helped us grow globally and make a good quality product in addition to the use of technology. They go hand by hand. So innovation has two pillars, uh, the people aspect to it, who has passion and the transparency and the, uh, the, the trust to it, as well as the technology. We have access to one, some of the leading edge technology, whether it's a tech center or through our collaborations globally. And that's how we can really change the way we build. And we take that as a way to extend. We launched it two years ago, the IDEA platform, which is Innovations for Design, Engineering, and Automation, mm -hmm. to really extend our leading edge technology capabilities to architects, engineers, and other builders throughout the US and globally to really push, hey, this, this works, and that's how it will work. And we apply it, whether it's a small project or a larger project, scale doesn't matter. It's about the big idea. Actually, some of the smaller projects cannot afford the losing money, mm -hmm. cannot afford the risk of, uh, of uh, a, a big error. Yeah. So that's why margins, QEQC, so small exactly, margins, yeah. as well as uh, larger projects. It's, uh, it's really built upon trust. Yeah, and, and those two things are also deeply interconnected too. The trust in people are not two separate you know, conversations and the technology isn't a third separate conversation from it. And if you look inwardly in your businesses as well, the, the trust necessary to adopt these new methods and these new tools and technologies and processes is fundamental to being successful with your business because sometimes it's hard to change perceptions, especially as you alluded to earlier, we've been building things for 80, 100, 120 years in a very similar fashion and for good reason. But now that we're starting to get new technologies and tools and the necessity to do these things at a faster pace or at a different scale has really forced us to, to be innovative. But if your people don't trust you and you bring these tools to them and you don't have an honest conversation about it, there's going to be some hesitancy and it introduces a lot of risk into your business as well. And I don't. I, I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman when I was talking about this before because I don't necessarily mean turning your entire company into a democratic process, everybody votes on the tool that you're going to implement, but you have to have that two-way conversation. You have to go to your superintendents and you say, tell me about your process and if we did this, what would happen or how would this change this or how would this impact you? Because if you don't, one, you might be introducing a process that makes your job harder. I've been hearing more of that too. It's, it's a balance of understanding that deeply enough where the tools that the office is asking to implement in the field aren't burdensome, but actually an asset to those teams. And the only way to get those implemented and make that happen is through those conversations and through the trust that you're talking about here. Absolutely. Most of our VDC team time is actually communicating very well in real time with the field team as well as a project management team in the office on how we can listen, learn, and respond with all the technologies and capabilities we have to offer uh, tech-first solutions. So our work is always about mitigating risk, having no surprises on site, or saving costs with additive manufacturing, for example. It was, we get a quote, that's how it would cost the traditional method, and that's how we're going to do it with digital prefabrication. And the aha moment, actually, is yeah. when you find the cost savings as well as the better quality. Yeah. That's the balance we always do. And our, uh, some of our core values is taking intelligent risks, and this is intelligent risk, as well as building great things with great people, which is a part of the culture of embracing innovation. When we go to our superintendents on the side and we tell them about this new unprecedented way of tackling this laser scan idea or BEM idea, 
they embrace it and say, let's try it, let's see it. And when it works and we provide a value with it mitigating risk or increasing safety, that's when it gets implemented across the board for our projects. In your point there, that that idea moment, that aha moment is huge. And it, it really shows that you've created that culture internally because if you don't set people up to be comfortable to take some risks and to potentially fail on occasion, as long as the scale of that failure is something that is manageable and can be contained and doesn't negatively impact the overall project scope and scale, it's okay sometimes for that to not go well because you're still trying to figure these new tools and new technologies out. And then you have an honest conversation that's not a gotcha conversation. It's just what didn't go well and why? And what do we do the next time to you know augment or mitigate that challenge? And that's a very different conversation. I've unfortunately also been in the room where we've had grown men standing on the either side of a conference table, you know, screaming at each other over a schedule slippage or a material delay that they weren't anticipating. Yeah. And I have empathy in that situation because there there are big implications when you're working on a four hundred million dollar project and you have liquid, liquid liquidated damages every day of five grand or something. If you go over schedule, there's a reason to be concerned, but there's also a way to approach that conversation that has a bit more, I think, equity and honest appreciation for your staff and especially the younger people we were talking about earlier they're not going to respond well if they're getting screamed at by their boss that's just not how that sits and so i think as you build that culture it really sets everybody up to be in a wonderful position absolutely i totally agree with you culture of constant learning too like here at the tech center we utilize the different equipment different machines different robotic arms to do the same solution and we found out that that one is the most efficient and best one. It's a part of the learning curve. So next time we're gonna do a similar project, we know the way to go. Yeah, just that's how we learn. We learn constant learning. We learn something new every every day, and that's how we're actually in the BEM or the innovation process, we can always uh, advance our uh, way of thinking and our applications too. We're really fortunate to be sitting in this industry at this moment right now because, I mean, we've all seen that horrible statistic where like construction isn't pro in innovative and increased productivity in years. I hate when I see it in presentations now because I'm like, that is not true. Like, it's just simply inaccurate now. We have so many opportunities for growth. There are so many things changing. And what a fun and just neat time to be sitting in a space like this. Like, look around us. You know, I mean, we have a giant robot arm sitting, you know, three behind, <laughs> three feet or to my right. It's, it's just a really cool moment. And I appreciate you taking some time to share some of your experience and knowledge about the industry with us today. So you likely remember me asking this question the last time you were on, and I like coming back the second time because, you know, sometimes you get some new answers, some interesting ones. So I can't help but ask again, but what is one tool that you will always use on every project that you work on? It's actually the pencil. Uh, I uh, start every uh, thought process with a pencil and a plank paper. It helps me brainstorm and the ideas before going digital, which mm -hmm. is very important. All my work is actually on computers and robotics and drones and laser scanners. But before I get there, it's that, that pencil ideas that I can sketch and the start of the thought process. And the nice thing about the pencil, it can always help us correct ourselves. When I do a mistake, I can erase it and correct it the best. It goes towards justice <laughs> at the end. So actually the pencil is uh, the only one thing I, I use every day and uh, in our thought process, in, in any thought process actually. It's, it's nice to hear because there's something to be said about getting something out on paper, like a physical thing. I, I'm much like you, 99% of my, my work and my workflows and everything I do, whether it's you know all the things sitting in front of us right now or what we're doing on our computers, is a, is a digital realm, but sometimes like my to-do list, for example, I, I have to write everything on paper. I just, I can't help it. And it's also so satisfying to just, you know, uh, check those things off once you've, you know, achieved whatever task you're working on. But, but I like that perspective. Like we're, we're a largely digital environment now, but you know, sometimes uh, the pencil and paper still has its place. So I've got one question for you. What's the best way for listeners out there to reach you? Or is there anything they'd like to share with their listeners today that you're working on or that you think that they should be, uh, you know, aware of? They can always reach to, uh, to me and through uh, my LinkedIn or Wendover website. Uh, it's out there. I, be, I would be speaking, uh, for example, in Australia in mid-May, uh, mid doing a keynote for Construction Innovation Forum there, speaking in the Netherlands next week for GeoBAM, a great conference. So if folks from Europe or from New Zealand or Australia would love to see you there in Australia, as well as more events coming in Phoenix. So I'd love to, these, these events, in, of course, at Autodesk University too, these events is really how we can exchange ideas and learn from each other. It's about the big ideas and how 
we show, I love always when I speak in, in these events to show case studies, how we did that. So it's an educational content to folks. And that's what I would say, if that's possible, that we use in our jobs too. And you are doing the same through your uh, amazing um, episodes is to, to let Thank folks you. know what's possible out there to advance our industry. And that's one of the f more fun things about our industry too. Like obviously everybody has their, you know, competitive intel and such that they might not be as interested in sharing. But as far as bringing our industry forward, all these events that you're talking about, those are the, the levers to pull to be able to do this. I can't wait until Autodesk University this year where we get so many people together to to talk about all of this technology and share. And you can just feel the excitement with you know other people such as yourself. Uh, and I'm just flattered that we have the opportunity to sit down with you. I mean, you're, you're keynoting all of these events and you, know, you have some really great passion for the industry and uh, I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much. So everybody out there listening, of course, this is another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. If you, Again, if you are listening on Spotify or Apple or anywhere else, make sure you click the link in the show notes and go check out what we're doing over on YouTube. The, uh, the video experience is, you know, an extra and exciting overlay on top of uh, our traditional audio format you may be uh, familiar with and love already. Also, if you have a moment to go out and rate our show on any of the players that you're listening to, I'd appreciate five stars, but give us whatever you feel uh, appropriate. It does make a big impact on the back end. And then, of course, if you're over on YouTube, you can find us on the Autodesk Construction Cloud YouTube YouTube page. There's a playlist with all of those different episodes and it's pretty easy to find you. And if you want to talk to me, of course, I'm always happy to uh, connect on LinkedIn. You can find me. I'm Eric Thomas or on Twitter at builder underscore digital. And uh, without uh, further ado, goodbye.